Right, so Terry wanted me to do a bit about myself before I talked about quail, which I would rather not, but we'll tell a bit. Um, I first got quail because I was in market and there had been a lot coming that day and a mate that had been going there a lot longer than me told me whatever you, I did, I was not to buy any quail and so I bought about half the birds in the market not knowing anything about them and since then I've made about 20,000 um, yeah so on to the genetic stuff the first image is a pure pharaoh pair with the N on the left and the cut bird on the right pretty simple to tell apart speckles on the end's breast and creamer coloured and rust coloured breast on the cock bird the second photo is some six week old hens on the left pharaoh so pure wild type on the centre is an italian so heterozygous fawn and on the right is a manchurian so homozygous fawn the italian is quite simple to recognise very yellow base colour with a mix of black and red spots on the back for feather sexing it's the same as pharaohs pretty simple the Manchurian compared to the Italian will have next to no red spots on the back and less of the black spots and as it ages will have a clear breast with no spots on it on the hens the third photo is a Manchurian pair, so homozygous fawn. As you can see, the cocks have a lot less markings on the back than the hens, and no markings on the breast at all, as opposed to a few down the edges on hens, or some on the young hens. Cocks also generally have a paler colour around the head, so brown or rust rather than black or dark brown. Um, yeah simple to feather sex but have to go off the head or back markings rather than the breast markings although there is a slight difference in shade on the breast markings the markings on the birds will decrease on any fawn as they age so younger birds up till four weeks even Manchurian hens will have a lot of speckles on the breast whereas older birds will keep losing it as they age the fourth photo is an Italian pair, so you can see a lot more markings on the backs and breast on the hens. The red markings present on both sexes as well. These are pretty simple to feather sex, as you can see. Less markings on the he head for the hen, but darker. More but paler markings on the head for the cock. And a darker base colour on the breast for the cock. And speckles on the breast for the hen final photo in this batch is a Manchurian cock on the left so homozygous fawn centre is an Italian cock so heterozygous fawn and on the right is a pharaoh cock so wild type again you can see pretty much the same homozygous fawn with very little markings of any colour and a dark gold colour all over. Heterozygous fawn with a lot of red and black markings on the back and a gold colour on the rest of the body. And again, pure wild type with a rust coloured breast and a brown back with gold feather pinning. Second batch of photos is extended black. The left on the left in both photos is a pure pharaoh hen in the centre is a rosetta with no other genes and on the right is a tibetan the rosetta and tibetan aren't feather sexable so cocks and hens will look very similar however there is slight differences especially in rosetta where the cocks will be in general more red however this can be affected by sex link brown or fawn as well the 
Rosetta still have the gold centre feather pinning that the fairies do on the back. However, it is a lot finer and less prominent. They do not have the cream coloured breast and instead have a black and brown barred colouring on the breast. The Tibetans are slightly darker than the Rosetta and lack the centre feather pin gold centre feather pinning down the back and on some of the other feathers they will st they can still have some barring on the feathers and the black and brown barring on the breast you will notice on the rosetta there is white under the beak this is not caused by tuxedo or by dotted white gene this is the extended black gene which can cause minimum amount, minimal amounts of white on the breast or chin the feet on the Rosetta and Tibetans will generally be a mix of light and dark skin, the, with the Tibetans more likely to have a solid dark feet, however this generally only occurs with a lot of selection. What I forgot to mention before is fawn, is that the Bigouti or Asip locus, and Extended black is at the black or MC1R locus. Both of the genes we've talked about so far are autosomal incomplete dominant, meaning they overpower wild type in both heterozygous and homozygous, but heterozygous and homozygous present differently in the phenotype. The next batch of photos, third batch for Terry, is sparkly. The first of these has a homozygous sparkly cock on the left, a heterozygous sparkly cock on the centre, and a pure pharaoh cock on the right, as does the second. You can see on the heterozygous sparkly cock centre, it's got a slightly darker back than the pure pharaoh, with slightly more barring on the wing coverts and the breast is a much darker maroon colour rather than rust and has a white centre feather pinning on the feathers instead of being the same colour all over. On the homozygous sparkly cock you can see the back has become a much darker almost black under shade with gold and maroon barring and very little gold centre pinning on any of the feathers. It is present on some, but only very minor. The breast, you can see, in general, has the same base, maroon base shade as the heterozygous cock, with the same white centre pinning. However, it is a lot less prominent. This is a young cock bird, however, and this will increase with age, as it has done on the heterozygous cock bird. The next batch of photos is or carrying on the same batch is a, heter a homozygous sparkly pair first with the hen left and the cock on the right the hen has a black and gold barring on the breast as opposed to the cock having a maroon base colour with a gold centre pinning the hen also has a darker and slightly duller back the next photo down is a heterozygous sparkly pair with the cock on the left and the hen on the right. As you can see the cock has a maroon coloured base feather to the breast feathers, base colour to the breast feathers and a white centre pinning and is a lot redder in tone than the hen. The hen has the black speckles with the cream base the same as on Pharaoh However, the speckles are a lot more regular and show right down through to the underbelly rather than just nearer the throat. The third photo is a pure ferro pair. For comparison, you can see the speckles are nowhere near as regular or large on the hen and do not follow down under the belly and the cock's breast is paler and lacking the white centre pinning. Fifth batch of photos is calicos. 
the first photo is all hens, all mature hens, with a pure pharaoh on the left, a heterozygous calico center, and a homozygous calico on the right, as is the following photo. As you can see, the heterozygous calico hen is lacking the majority of the speckles on the breast, however still has the same tone. The gold centre pinning on her back feathers is also a lot more prominent, and the wing coverts are a lot paler in shade. The homozygous calico hen, can, you can see, has a paler overall tone, with a much paler back, no speckles at all on the breast, and a more gold shade to the back, lacking a lot of the markings present on Vera. The sixth batch of photos, the sixth batch of photos, is blues, which the first photo is actually a pure Faro pair for comparison. The second photo is a blue heterozygous blue pair with the hen on the left and the cock on the right. As you can see, they're a lot paler in shade than the pharaohs, however still have the red tones the same, just any black tones diluted. The hen, you can see, still has the speckles on the breast. If you're trying to feather sex these birds, then the speckles will show up by far the best under an LED torch light, like the one on your phone. Um, they can be feather sex just the same as pharaoh in that way with the cocks having the rust coloured breast and the hens having the paler speckled breast. The third photo in this batch is a homozygous blue cock bird. You can see they're almost white in shade, but have a dark beak and eyes, or have a dark beak unlike dotted white birds, and still possess the pharaoh markings, just extremely diluted. The seventh batch of photos is dotted white, so on the left on the first photo is an English white or homozygous dotted white, in the centre is a ferro tuxedo, so heterozygous dotted white with no other genes, and on the right is a pure ferro cockbird for comparison. As you can see, heterozygous gives a tuxedo marked appearance, However, on most pharaohs, pharaoh lines that haven't been selected for this appearance, this will present as simply a few feathers on the breast or wings. The cockbird in, in the picture has been, is off a line that's been selected for about five to seven generations for tuxedo markings on the breast, giving them a proper tuxedo appearance. All of these birds only have the dotted white gene affecting them and no other gene. The next photo down has a dotted white bird on the left, or homozygous dotted white, so English white bird on the left, a heterozygous dotted white on homozygous EB base in the centre, so a Tibetan tuxedo, and a Tibetan on the right. The bird in the centre, as opposed to the pharaoh tuxedo, is how most Tibetan tuxedos will appear without selection. As, dotted, as extended black can show some white on birds without the dotted white gene, it also increases the white coverage on birds with the dotted white gene, meaning it's easier to breed the proper tuxedo markings. The dotted white, the English whites that are extended black based are generally very similar to the wild type based ones, however, although they can be less although they can more regularly show as pure white birds not having any dots. Right, the eighth batch of photos. This gene isn't as common anywhere, but is one of my favourites, so I wanted to include it, is the white wing pie gene. The bird on the left in the first photo is a homozygous white wing pied on homozygous EB, so a Tibetan white wing pied. The bird on the right is a homozygous EB, homozygous dotted white, so English white. 
the as you can see on the English white the ideal markings and the most common is a white bird with a single dot on the head as opposed to the white winged pied which present with nearly a tuxedo marking other than little to no colour on the wings and breed true in this marking as opposed to tuxedos that don't. Um, the next photo down mentioning tuxedo has a homozygous EB heterozygous dotted white on the left so a Tibetan tuxedo and the right has a homozygous EB homozygous white wing pied so a Tibetan white wing pied as you can see the white wing pied whilst it had more colour than the English white has a lot less colour on it than the tuxedo and whereas the tuxedo will when bred together will produce a quarter solid coloured birds half tuxedo and a quarter and a quarter English white the white wing pied when bred together will produce a hundred percent white wing pied this is one of the original pens I had when the white wing pie gene was first recorded and one of the pens where my line which is the most which has ended up becoming the most common through Adam and some others has originated these were a mixture of dotted white and white wing pied birds that have mista been mistaken as just bad English whites and tuxedos the next batch of photos ninth batch is fees so the first is Falb Fee and Pharaoh Cox. The on the left is a Falb Fee, however it is only heterozygous fee. Homozygous fee would be a lot would be lacking red tones completely, whereas this bird still has partial red tones showing. It is however, however very different to the Pharaoh with a white instead of rust coloured breast and red tones lacking from the majority of the rest of the body. The next photo down is Grouffy on the left and Rosetta on the right. Both are heterozygous EB, however Grouffy can be heterozygous or homozygous EB. The Grouffy then also has heterozygous V, which Grouffy should ideally be homozygous V. The bird in question isn't and still possesses a few red tones because of this. The next photo down is pearl fees both are homozygous fawn pearl fee is pearl fee on the left and manchurian on the right both hens both are homozygous fawn pearl fee can however be homozygous or heterozygous fawn again as with the others they should ideally be homozygous for fee to remove all red tones this bird is not it is heterozygous fee instead meaning some of the red tones are still present Again, up until this point, all of the genes we've talked about have been autosomal incomplete dominant, meaning they are not sex-linked, and one copy of the gene is enough to change wild-type appearance, and a second copy of the gene gives a different phenotype, phenotype to one copy. However, the tenth batch of photos are Rooks birds, or Roo birds, this gene is sex-linked recessive, meaning hens can only have one copy of it, and whereas cocks can have two. Meaning hens either have it or don't, and cocks can either have it and display it, or be carriers, or not have it. On the first photo, oh, we also have sex-linked brown in these photos, which is again sex-linked recessive and is recessive to Roo. On the left we have an Egyptian, all these are hens, on the left we have an Egyptian hen, so Rook some wild type. In the centre we have a sex link brown hen, so wild type just with the addition of sex link brown. And on the right we have a pure pharaoh hen. The order of dominance for these is pharaoh, Roo and sex link brown meaning pharaoh is dominant to roo, roo is recessive to pharaoh but dominant to sex link brown and sex link brown is dominant to both. Most lines that are called wild type of pharaoh will be a mix of pharaoh and sex link brown and it can be difficult to ID between them. 
as you can see on the back so the pharaoh has a small red collar around the neck whereas the red collar around the neck on the sex link brown extends much further back and the whole body is a much paler redder shade the wing coverts on the sex link brown are gen generally also have fainter or sparser barring the egyptian is a lot more easily recognisable with a red tone to the entire body. The next photo is Pharaoh and Egyptian Cox with the Pharaoh on the left and the Egyptian so wild type plus homozygous Rue on the right. Again the Egyptian has a much redder tone to the entire body and the wing coverts will be ash grey instead of black. The next photo down is an Italian cockbird on the left and a Autumnamba cockbird on the right. So both are heterozygous fawn, but the Autumnamba cockbird also has has the Rue gene, homozygous. Um, again, a much redder tone to the entire body on the bird with Rue, and any black markings are turned to an ash grey colour. Specifically, the spots on the back and the wing coverts. The final photo shows an Egyptian hen on the left, a scarlet hen on the right, on the centre and a range hen on the right. So the Egyptian is wild type or pharaoh with the addition of Rue. The scarlet is Rosetta with the addition, so heterozygous extended black with the addition of Rue and the range on the right is Tibetan, so homozygous extended black with the addition of Rue. Egyptian are feather sexable as we have seen further up with the hens possessing the same speckles on the breast as pharaoh and the cocks possessing the same rust coloured breast however the scarlet and the range are not feather sexable as Rosetta and Tibetan aren't either. The 11th batch of photos I thought I would do a bit on sizes of quail so on the first photo we have a bantam cockbird on the left a standard cockbird centre and a jumbo cockbird on the right all are fully mature cockbirds with showing the size in size differences on mature birds the bantams will be 3 to 5 ounces so 110 to 140 grams roughly the standards will be 6 to 9 ounces so 170 to 260 grams roughly and the jumbos will be 10 ounces plus at maturity so 284 or 86 grams plus at maturity the all birds are weighed at maturity with bantams reaching maturity at six weeks generally standards at eight and jumbos at 10. The weight ranges stated are for both cocks and hens, however hens will generally be 10 to 20 percent heavier than the male counterparts in each size. Uh, variation is found within all birds, however the aim should be to keep lines as close to central in those weight ranges as possible. For jumbos most lines will tend to be or most good lines will tend to be 14 to 16 ounces at maturity any heavier is possible and up to 19 ounces or heavier have been recorded however they tend to have much higher incidences of foot problems and leg problems for the next photo I thought I would show the difference in um, how different birds can weigh and look versus look both of the hens in the picture are from the same hatch and off by memory are about six to seven weeks old maybe slightly older might be nearer ten actually um, I can't remember the exact age but both were from the same hatch reared together their entire lives and treated exactly the same simply off different lines the as you can see the Manchurian hen on the left is far smaller in si in physical size than the blue hen on the right 
However, both of these birds were weighed at the same time and on the date they were pictured and both weighed 321 grams. The Manchuria hen was far, far more solid bird with tighter feathering and a much better fleshed breast, whereas the blue hen was a much framier bird but with not so great muscling and looser feathering. Whilst it may be counterintuitive, the blue hen would be the better hen to use for starting a line of jumbos. As whilst the Manchurian is better muscled, if she gets any heavier the frame simply won't be capable, or if the line was bred any heavier with the same type, the, they will simply wouldn't be capable of handling their own weight with their structure. Whereas as has been said before by other breeders, build the frame then hang the meat. The bluebird is much more capable of carrying far more weight if the line is selected to a greater size and then selected for fleshing ability once the frame is sufficient to handle it. I think that is everything covered. Um, thank you for having me Terry. Thank you.